This episode of The Dog Show features Doggy Dan. Dan is the founder of the Online Dog Trainer, a wildly successful training program for dog owners. In the last decade, he has helped over 56,000 people successfully train their dogs to overcome behavioral issues. Dan is also the owner of three dogs, Inca, Moses, and Jack, and the author of the book, What the Dogs Taught Me About Being a Parent. In the interview, we talk about why dogs display aggressive behavior and how you can stop a dog being aggressive with Dan's one-of-a-kind training process, the Dog Calming Code. Doggy Dan, so welcome to the Dog Show. Thanks for coming on today. My pleasure. Um, I wanted to start out to hear a little bit more about your three dogs. So you've got three dogs, Inca, Moses, and Jack. Do you want to tell me a bit more about them? Yeah, for sure. So... Just like people, they're all different, you know? Yeah. Couldn't be more different if they tried, to be honest. So I always talk to people about the range. One of the easiest ways to kind of um, categorize a dog's personality is whether they're confident or fearful. So if you think of it like this, we've got, and uh, for those of you who are just listening and can't see my hands waving around, I've got one hand on the left-hand side and one hand on the right-hand side over here. So as wide as they can be apart sort of thing. And if confidence is on the left, That's where Jack sits. He sits right at that extreme. He is the most confident, and with that comes dominant, you know, dog. He's also a powerful, big beast. He's called a Catahoula leopard dog. Part part that. Sounds powerful. (laughs) He's a powerful. He's got one blue eye, one brown eye, and when he looks at you, he doesn't blink. He doesn't look away. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's Jack. So he'd be, he's a pack leader sort of dog. And then on the right-hand side, we have little Inky Tinky. She's a whippity pit bull, and she's one of the most nervous, fearful dogs when we got her. This is like their personality, their natural, that personality nature, mm. which is very hard to change. So we've got those two extremes, little nervous Inky Tinky. She's actually a grandma now, about 14 years old. Jack's about six. And then in the middle, we have Moses, who's, yeah, he's a working dog. He's like a border collie cross hunt away, mm. lab cross. So he's a... He likes to just, he's, he's got tight muscular structure. He's got black and white hair like a border collie. And he just likes moving and jogging. He would jog for eight hours a day every day. He'd love it on a farm. And he tries really hard to be above Jack in the pack. But Jack is the king. And so Moses is this very, very second in command, kind of trying hard all the time. But okay. Jack, does, Jack doesn't give an inch. That's the three dogs. Do you think the dogs can hover between those two ends of the spectrums that you mentioned? So that again, the dogs, you mean one dog in particular? One, one dog in particular, because I guess the reason I ask is um, in different situations, sometimes I notice dogs all will have a different, I, I guess, default way to to act. Absolutely. So so on the farm, that is one of the few, when we when I say on the farm, we don't have a farm, but my wife um, goes and rides a horse on somebody's farm. And lo and behold, Moses literally just takes the lead. He says, this is my domain. I know what's going on here, buddy. And it is like it is in his DNA, which I'm sure it is. It's in his bloodstream. He knows. We said it the other day. He can touch these electric fences and he can almost hear the tick, tick. He goes up to them and he pushes through underneath. It's like he he doesn't get hit by the tick electric shock Mm. because he almost understands how the electricity works through the wire. That is a farm dog. Mm. And so he runs around, and Jack, on the other hand, has been bolted by the electric fences too many times. <laughs> and he really goes, I don't understand this place. This is crazy. Mm. He's also not sure of how the horse works. Yeah. <laughs> Moses, is, Moses is like, it's easy, man. It's a horse. Let me show you. Just So it's incredible in that place. Moses takes the lead a bit. And, um, yeah, in other situations, you know, but generally speaking, you know, they hold. You mentioned that Moses requires quite a lot of exercise. If there's a bit of border collie in there, yeah. um, could run forever. How do yeah. you how do you manage the I guess the different level of exercises that each of the dog needs on a daily basis? Yeah, yeah, with difficulty sometimes. Mm. Um, I mean, it is it is tricky, but but generally speaking, you know, we go for a walk, we go for we go for a far walk. Moses just jogs around nonstop, and um, and. Jack is more of a sprinter, so he sprints mm. and then he's quite tired and then he sprints again. So they do what they need to do, mm. but for sure Moses could do more. The problem with Moses and, and exercising him more is we actually found 
But if we took him out for two walks a day, he did get fitter, mm. even fitter. And and then you'd stand up towards the end of the day when they'd had two walks, and he'd jump up, wagging his tail like, are we going again? Yeah. I was like, he wants another walk. This is just getting silly. <laughs> If you take him for three walks, he'll want four. And if you take him for four, he'd want five. So we actually cut it back and said, no, you know, <laughs> one walk a day, one big walk, and then he'll know he can switch off and relax. And, um, yeah, there's not he's getting, I don't he's think, getting too healthy. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think there's many dogs that would turn down a walk, even if they were tired. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Would you say you have a, a favourite dog breed? Have you had? I mean, you've been, you've experienced with so many other breeds. I imagine over your career and your life. But would you say you have a favourite dog breed? I, I really would say, I would say I do not have a favourite dog breed. Hmm. I what? have some sort of preferences, but but the preferences I have are just totally kind of knocked out the water when I actually meet another breed which I thought I didn't like. You know, yeah, I might not. I'm going to say don't like. What I mean is I, I don't have a really strong urge towards that breed. Mm. And then I'll meet a dog who's the most sweetest natured or personality, and that sweetness could be just cute or powerful or obedient or cuddly. or, And then you just fall in love with that breed. Yeah. So, so you- I would suggest that most people who dislike a certain breed, they actually just haven't met and connected with many dogs of that breed which which loved them and which were amazing. It's yeah, I think that's a really um, good good way to sum it up because I think I've had that experience in the past myself where you think, oh, for whatever reason, you're indifferent about a certain breed, yeah. but yeah. then when you have more exposure to them because a friend has them or you, yeah. you, you yeah. your dog sit them or something, you all of a sudden realise so many great great traits they have you didn't and know it's, about. It's so. just it's just basically racism in dogs. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's breedism. It all is. it is is breedism. You know, you yeah. you create this prejudice because you have one bad experience with a German Shepherd and. Mm. Yes, you know, I hate those German Shepherds. I don't know why anybody likes them. And then I go to another house and they go, oh, we've had 12 German Shepherds. It's the only dog for us. And they were, they'll they actually repeat the same reasons, only the reverse of that reason as to why they love Jim. So one person will say, you know, they're just disobedient. They're aggressive. They're just not very affectionate. And, um, and then the other people who love them will say they're just so obedient. They're so affectionate. <laughs> they're so protective of the family. They'd never be aggressive to you, you know. Yeah, well, it's just how we see it through our own eyes. Exactly. It comes down to your own experience. I mm. imagine it's similar in the same respect. As much as people might dislike a certain dog, they also get very attached to a certain breed as well. Oh, as you, gosh, yeah. 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 And then you have three, and then that becomes your significance in life that – I'm I'm a pug person, which is beautiful. Don't get me wrong; I'm not knocking it. It's um, I actually like the variety. I enjoy yeah. the variety. The online dog trainer, which is your business, um, you've yes. got over a hundred thousand subscribers, and you've been working, got an extensive background working in um with dog behavioural issues issues uh, across. Mm. You know, you've written a book, you've been on TV, you've pretty much done everything there is when it comes to dog trainers. What? Mm. What kind of led you into this industry? What got you into, into this industry initially? Um, I, I, I did a lot of jobs. I had a lot of careers. Yeah. And I didn't enjoy any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I refused to settle for a career in my life which didn't really spin my wheels and motivate me that I wasn't passionate about. So I kept looking and finally I quit a corporate, uh, corporate career as a a sales manager of a at a, a very large wine wine company. I was in charge of a team of people, and I quit that. I went to a careers advisor, and I said to her, "Look, I've had, I've been a I'm an ex policeman. I've, I've got a civil engineering degree. I've taught maths in school. Um, I've had also, I've, I, you know, I need to find something I'm passionate about." And she actually helped me identify that dogs was a key part of my life and had been for the last thirty years, thirty five years actually. And I said, is that a big thing? She says, throughout your life, from she actually took me back into an almost a hypnotic state <laughs> yeah. and said, tell me your very, very first memory. And it was like a spider's web, she, or spiral. She drew outwards at five, do you remember, at six years old. And throughout my life, dogs popped up in that spiral. Whether it was um, before school, aged five, I remember going to walk. Mrs. Hackett's dogs, which were Weimaranas, Right, okay. She was called Mrs. Hackett. She had five Weimaranas, and I used to walk them with her. And there was eight dogs on our street, and they all began with the letter B. 
Bernie, Baron, Ben, Billy, Barney, Bernie. <laughs> and then I went to my grandparents' house in the summer holidays, played with a dog yeah. called Bunny. And she just said, that's a massive thing. You keep bringing up dogs. And then and, uh, that I just went for it. I, I, I'm somebody who once I turn and focus on something, I'm pretty committed to it. So I just started tracking down as many dog courses, books, you know, qualifications sort of things I could. And, and But most importantly, what I found was useful was actually experience on the ground with large packs of dogs. Mm. So my dogs are really the ones that taught me is, is how I feel. Mm. I mean, that was an achievement in itself, walking five Waimaramas at, at the same time. <laughs> this lady must have been about 60 years old and she had a big whistle. And yeah. The dogs would disappear, but if she needed the dogs, she blow the whistle. And true story, once she was once walking in the Dean, which is a very rough patch of land without any houses nearby. Hmm. And uh, two men came up and started to attack her, tried to rob her. Oh, wow. They didn't know that she had five dogs because none of the dogs were around her. Oh. She blew the whistle. And five dogs, it must have been like Hound of the Basketball, you know. <laughs> these five dogs came just charging towards these men mm. and knocked them to the ground and, um, yeah, gave them a severe telling off. Yeah, well, it's a good story. It's also um, yeah. hopefully a learning for those men that were doing the wrong yeah. thing. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot of dog, five Waimaranas. They're not uh, small either, are they? Or No, they're not small. Then, no. And they would, no one would have had to explain to them what was happening. They'd have just picked up on the energy, her yeah. shouting and screaming, and two men. On your website, you've got a ton of info, information about behavioral yeah. dog issues. Um, one that really caught my eye was the dog calming code. So that's one of your yep. co- one of your courses. Um, that's right, and it helps people deal with dog aggression predominantly. Is that right? Well, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess one question I had about that was what what types of aggressive behaviour can be I guess fixed using your process in in this course? Well, pretty much anything. To be honest, the the, the dog calming code is the most it's the, it's the most powerful course we have. And just for anyone who's interested in it, it is included in the complete pack. So whilst the dog coming code is what I'm going to share and talk about a little bit today, if you're really committed, you know, I'd suggest you go and check out the complete pack, partly because it has a $1 trial. So you can actually get the trial, the whole thing before you even, yeah, you know, three-day trial for $1. But what the, what the dog coming code is, is it's that fundamental piece of the puzzle which so many people struggle with because it's almost like that's oh, what's the best angle to take on this? You have to get your dog on side. Mm. You have to get your dog understanding that you're the one that they should be listening to. To and when it comes to aggression, it's especially when there's danger around because most people can have a dog. Most people who've got dog aggression problems, most people, not everyone, they have a dog who's pretty pretty calm in the house, pretty obedient, sit down, stay, roly-poly, high five. They can get it to do all these tricks, walks nicely on the lead. And it's only when it really matters when there's another dog, the dog suddenly goes boom. Mm. And that may be around, it may actually be more around food or it may be because the dog's too excited around other dogs. It may be because the dog's fearful around other dogs. It may be aggression towards people. It may be a regression around for the property at the front door, or they may just have a dominant dog. Or the other area of aggression is when there's a dog on dog living in the same home. So all, I think that's eight different types of aggression. There's the eight main types of dog aggression. And all of them really um, kind of, it falls apart in that split second when, you know, when the two dogs come together at the front door to go out. Or when there's an excited dog turns up in your dog's face, or your dog may be that excited dog to see other dogs, or fearful, or a person comes too close, and suddenly all the training in the world just is, it's not worth anything. All that sit down, stay, recall, walk. Mm. And for me, the analogy, the best analogy I can give is it's like a child, a boy or a girl who just keeps getting into fights at school. And at that point where something happens and they just get angry and start to build up and then just explode and punch somebody. It's almost like most training, most dog training that people are doing 
is as effective as getting that child and saying to that child, we're going to teach you how to do art. Or we're going to teach you how to do spelling. Or we're going to get you to do more um, math mathematics. It doesn't really help that much at that point when the person's going to explode because they're so angry. There's an underlying issue which is not being addressed. And so you might be able to do all the times table and learn all your times table, do algebra, but that doesn't help the child become calmer when it really matters. And it's like that with dog training. People are doing all this walking around in circles with a piece of cheese, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use cheese, but you know what I mean? All this training, repetitive training or sit down, stay, but it doesn't sort out the real underlying issue. And that's, that's what the dog calming code does. It goes to the foundation of, and so much of it is about who's in charge, because those dogs, when you give them the wrong message and they think that they're in charge, that's the real reason, that's the real problem as to why they're being dominant or whether they're scared or whether they're fighting in the same house or really aggressive around the food. So when you deal with that cause of the problem, the underlying issue, suddenly things start getting really way better, much, much quicker. So it's easier and faster than traditional dog training. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess from an owner's perspective, I'm always thinking about the symptoms, right? You know, the things, the behaviors that they're doing, you're thinking, how do I fix that? Whereas yep. you're, you're almost reversing that and saying you need to get back to what the core issue yep. is. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And having worked with 3,000 dogs and received thousands of 3,000 dogs one-on-one -on -one, I should say mm. and received thousands and thousands of, of responses of people who just said can't believe it unbelievable mm. yeah these are people who've spent thousands of dollars with repetitive training techniques some positive only you know chicken and cheese and a clicker some of them far more negative with a shock collar and a chuck chain prong collar and then they try an approach which is getting the dog on side and helping the dog settle into a position Kind of where they're kind of more focused, more calm. So that's what the dog calming code is. At what point should an owner really be looking into a course like this? For example, obviously, if the, a dog is outwardly aggressive, um, that's like a, a natural thing to do. But is there earlier signs in behavior that an owner might go, you know what, it's now's the time to, to nip this in the bud rather than letting it get worse? Yeah, I mean, it's almost like, what age would you start training your child, your baby? Mm. And you really, you actually start training your, I'm, I'm tempted to, let me, hold on one second, Will. Okay. One second there. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a prop I'm going to bring in. Sure. <laughs> okay. The book, your book. <laughs> What the dogs taught me about being a parent. You see, one of the things about this, that's me with some hair on there, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things about the book was, I had this question when I wrote the book was, when do you start training? When do I start training my son? When do I start training my dog? When's the right time? Well, I knew with puppies, you wanted to start straight away. Mm. And it's the same with children. I mean, when I say training, the training's slightly different when they're, you know, three weeks old to when they're 13 years old, for sure. But it's the same with your puppy. The training you want to be putting in place at eight weeks old, there is some training there. Mm. For example, if your puppy's in the crate and it starts <clears throat> crying because it starts saying, I want this or I want that. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's different if it needs a wee-wee, pee-pee. But if your puppy's crying saying, I want to come out and you go and let the puppy out, then but you've just started <laughs> training the puppy to train you. Yeah, they learned, they learned how to get out. <laughs> so that's eight weeks old. So yeah. what I'm saying is, there's stuff you want to avoid doing wrong at eight weeks old. And there's stuff you want to be doing teaching the puppy at eight weeks. So there's no time like the present for putting this in place because it's basically it's the good manners stuff. It's the mm. creating the strong connection, the strong. It's almost like um, creating a positive relationship rather than a, a negative kind of unhealthy relationship. How do you create that healthy relationship? That starts. Straight away, yeah. I guess it's a. I guess it's the ideal situation is to get as early as possible when the the puppy, yep. you know, the dog or the puppy is still developing, right? But um, that's not always. It's not always that perfect, right? Maybe you've rescued an older dog, or maybe you just yep. ha haven't been as diligent when you were younger, and you're trying to deal with dog aggression now. So, 
how much harder does it get when a dog is older and is it still possible to overcome aggression issues? The thing with dogs is there are there are dogs who have had no training and they just, for whatever reason, DNA, the breed of the dog, um, and maybe that they just grew up in a nice environment, even though they never were, they may be a wild, kind of run pretty wild, but they were friendly. And, so some dogs can be really old, you know, mm. five, eight, ten years old, and they're pretty nice, easy, cruisy, relaxed dogs. And other dogs, you know, they may not have had the training put in place. I worked with one just the other day. I think he was seven months old, and he was a nightmare. Mm. He was so spoiled. You know, he'd had five months of all the wrong behaviors being done. Even this this lovely couple, they came to work with me, a little Pomeranian dog. And, and as I went through the dog calming code with them, they went, oh, we're doing the opposite of this. <laughs> we're doing the opposite of this. We're doing the opposite of this. I said, yeah, you've got the most spoiled little dog who thinks he's the king. He thinks he's in charge. He thinks he has to protect you. He thinks he has to protect the property, protect the car. That's his job as the one in charge. So, I mean, we've got a Pomeranian who's seven months old who's just doing the lead, pulling on the lead. His eyes are bulging. He's so stressed out. He's weeing himself. Mm. It was horrible to watch. and. He's terrified because this is a dog, as I talk about on that scale. He's by nature. He was a fearful dog. He was not a confident boy. He was terrified. And they had made this terrified little dog the king in their house of five people. So he did what he wanted, didn't listen to anybody, ruled the roost. And any noise, he was barking, terrified, scared, shaking. How can we help him? We answer. We've got to show him he's not in charge. We've got to get him to take a chill pill, put the dog calming code in place. And they will have a different dog. And that's a dog who's seven months old and was in real trouble. Mm. Um, so, yeah. it's. So I yeah, guess... There's the, no, no time like the present, and every dog is different. Yeah. Age isn't really the thing either. It's, just a, it's, it's about the process more than the age then. Yeah. I mean, you, you can have a pretty young dog who's pretty screwed up and you can have a much older dog who's, um, yeah, pretty, pretty cool, pretty cruisy. And you can have an older dog who'll learn really quick or you can have an older dog who's never really, really hard to change, you know, just like people. Some people just can't change aged 40. Other people aged 50 are like, I'm ready for a change. I'm ready for a break. Um, and that's what I mean by they are as varied as people. In every sense of the way, for me. I guess the million dollar quest question is, um, yeah, what which, is it? which would summarise everything we've yeah. discussed so far on the on the podcast yeah. and give everything, everything, everybody that listens everything they want to know about dog aggression. How do yeah. you stop a dog from being aggressive? Okay, so the first thing is you. This is contrary to all the other types of dog training. The thing is to, to change that relationship that you have with your dog so they are not in the driving seat making the decisions. Because if you think about two dogs in the same house, the real problem is that they're fighting over who's in charge. Trust me. It's, it's nothing to do with, you know, if they both know that you're in charge, and even more powerful is if you have a, a, a male and a female human in the house who are in charge, because then both male and female bases are covered then that's that's that sorted. If you have a very dominant dog, then one of the things is if they think they're in charge, they will be far more going over, I'm in charge, head over the top of all the other dogs. I mean, I've got one of these dogs in Jack. So I know how much trouble he was. I experienced it. And what solved it was me and my wife, Jenny, saying, Jack, you are not the king. You don't have to do all that stuff. Chill, be tolerant. And his tolerance increased hugely, not through... There isn't actually that much, well, there is some training you can do, but it's far easier to deal with the cause of the issue, that he thinks he's the king. Hmm. And with Inca, what made her more confident was us saying, Inca, we're in charge, trust us. When we're around, you don't need to make decisions. You know, and it's the difference between walking in the woods. See, if I'm walking in the woods as a, imagine you're a, 
if I'm a 10 year old boy walking in the woods and it gets dark and I'm lost, if I'm with my diet dad and I trust him, I still remember this as a child, you see, so this is why I use the analogy. Hmm. I was in the UK and the wind was blowing and we came out of the woods and there was an old church with grave gravestones and leaves were actually blowing around. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, this is a horror movie. This is terrible. Yeah. And I'm holding my dad's hand and he must have been much older than me because I was down here holding him. And I remember looking up at my dad, thinking, are we in trouble? And I just remember watching him yawn. Oh. <laughs> he wasn't bothered. And I thought, if you're not bothered, I'm not bothered. <laughs> there was no training required. I trust him. Yeah. He's cut him up. That's how it works with the fearful dogs. Become the one in charge, decision maker. And the other area, which is very, well, the two other areas is, one is if the dog is a hyper dog. If the dog is like so hyper, busybody, constantly getting into trouble because it races up to the other dog and licks their faces and jumps on them and barks. Then if you say to that dog, take a chill pill, relax. You don't need to go and meet and greet all the other dogs. By saying that you're not in charge, you tell that dog, you respect their space. You get the dog to learn how to respect other dogs' spaces. And you do that primarily by getting the dog to respect your space. Mm. And this is all part of the dog calming code. How do you train a dog to respect you? If your dog doesn't respect your space and you and jumps on you and jumps up at you at the door, come on. Surely you can make the connection. You think yeah. your dog's <laughs> going to be respectful of other dogs at the dog park? No, the dog jumps on them. You know, I've got, there's a title in this book. It says, if your child does not respect, if a child does not respect their mother or father, they'll respect no one in the world. It's not completely true, but you hear where they're coming from. That as a parent, you need to treat, teach your child to respect, and I mean respect in a loving, kind way, not kind of fear, but have some respect for. And so if you train your, a busybody dog to be, you know, karma, and that you're in charge, they are just such a different energy at the dog park. They don't get into trouble. And then the last area is around the house and around the front door. The real issue there is the dog thinks they're in charge. They are just protecting the fort. And in the same way as if, if you come to my house and my doorbell rings, who would answer the door? I'm guessing you based on what you've just said. <laughs> it's my house. Yeah. Of course I'd answer it. Because I'm in charge. Now, if I came to your house, and you're in charge at your house, and your doorbell rings, who would answer the door at your house? <laughs> well, I would, but yeah, my dog does run to the door and cause yeah. a bit of a ruckus, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about your dog just now. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you about your dog. But the point is, at your house, you would answer the door. You wouldn't have to train me not to answer the door at your house. It's automatic because... If you're in charge, the one that's in charge answers the door. And that is the key thing that's going on with these dogs. When they think they're in charge, they will get to that door and they'll bark and they'll go a bit nuts. And you can do all the trying to get them to stand behind you, but they're kind of like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is my job. This is my job. I've got to check out this pizza man or whoever it is. And so by dealing with the cause of the issue and saying to your dog, you're not in charge, they really do become so much easier to train. Take a chill pill. You know, the, door, the doorbell goes or the knock on the door. Of course, everyone gets a jump. The dog gets a fright, woof, 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 and jumps out of bed. But it's then so easy to say, thank you, Bruno, in your bed. Go on. Mm. I'll deal with this. The dog will let you deal with it as opposed to the dog racing around, barking, taking no notice of you. So that's how you stop this dog aggression, by becoming the one that's in charge, developing that healthy relationship. And um, there's a number of different... Uh, exercises that I share with people on how to do that. And that's primarily what the dog common code is, understanding it through the eyes of your dog as to what's in what's important. Yeah, so my summary of what you've just said and everything we've discussed today is really, and it goes back to the beginning of the interview, you spoke about understanding where your dog is on that spectrum of pack leader to timid and, and potentially um, frightened in certain situations, kind of understanding what your dog's like and then getting to the core of what may be causing the issue and letting them know who was in charge and, and putting them in a position where they feel trusted and safe. Yeah. So regardless of whether you've got a confident dog 
you still need to make sure those confident, dominant dogs know, yeah, you're a confident, dominant dog, Jack, but mm. you don't need to go around bossing all the other dogs. We're in charge. And with the fearful ones, you need to give them that security. And the dog calming code, basically it's through some very simple exercises. You know, and, and all of these are captured on videos. It's things like controlling the food, you know, to give you an idea, to give you a taste of what's a, a teaser of what's inside. You know, if you leave food on the ground, that is game over. That dog is in charge. Yeah, so Easiest way to screw your dog up is to leave a big bowl of food on the ground, which is what this little Pomeranian had. Hmm. And if he can come and graze, then he's in charge. He's controlling the most important resource there is in the world. And you'll end up with a far more dominant dog, kind of well, one that thinks he's in charge. Yeah, so I guess the that's the overarching understanding of how to deal with dog aggression. But if people really want to deal with it tactically and understand the steps they need to take. They should be checking out the dog calming code and getting the $1 trial for, for um, yeah. all your courses, which sounds fantastic. Yeah. The, the dog calming code, um, you can purchase that on its own as an individual thing. However, it's included in the complete pack and you can trial the complete pack for $1 US for three days. So that's the way I would go because then you can look through the dog coming code and see all the, the dog training to do with dog aggression. You know, when you go into it, there's a section, there's a course called dog problems and under dog problems, it has dog aggression, pulling a leash. And if you go into dog aggression, it has barking in the, you know, aggression towards other animals, aggression to dogs, aggression to dogs in the same home, aggression to cats. There's even a video of me working with a dog who's, a, who's only got three legs and he's trying to attack the horse. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there. That's cool, yeah. And and then like, there's no risk, I guess. A dollar, what's a dollar? If you can, um, yeah. you get a free trial, and then find if, and then, if the stuff you need's in there, perfect. You can keep on with it. Yeah, we have a laugh when people go, "Thanks so much. Can you cancel the trial? We've solved the problem." It's like, oh, great. That's the problem with having such a powerful program. <laughs> they literally, literally within three days, go, "We've got it. We see what we were doing wrong because it's the simple stuff." Yeah. They had the food on the ground or they were coming in the house and greeting their dog. Hello, boy. Boy jumps up, jumps <laughs> on them. They pat him and cuddle him. They don't understand. That's, that's game over. Your dog has just evaded space when you came in the house. It's a, that is the worst thing to do. And um, not understanding why the dog constantly coming over and climbing on top of them or demanding pets. Or how to deal, for example, with barking. If the dog barks in the house, what do you do? How do you stop it? You have to understand how to take control of that situation and say, hey, buddy, I'm in charge. No barking. Dog settles. And then when you go outside, the dog knows you're in charge. Totally different dog. Yeah. In the notes, I'll include a link to the, free, the $1 trial, um, the, the calm, sorry, the dog calming code as well, so people can access that course if they're looking for it. Where else can people find out about everything that you're doing, Dan? That's a darn good question. <laughs> I didn't think it was that. <laughs> After everything you've just answered, that, I thought that was the easiest question. <laughs> All right, I'm just trying to think, do I want to point people here, Facebook, YouTube? I'm trying to think where's a good place to point them. I mean, there are some free videos, obviously, on YouTube. Um, and I have a podcasting channel. The podcasting channels, are if you're interested in love dogs, then that's another great place to go and listen to some of the, the stuff that I share. Um, however, if you re if you do have a behavioral issue, I really, you know, there's blogs and all sorts of stuff. The, the, way, the biggest problem I have, to be honest, is the dog coming code is so powerful. I don't like to point people down rabbit holes, which lead to kind of crazy places when I know you know, if you've got a problem, let's just sort it. Yeah. Just, just Let's just go there straight away and sort it. It isn't rocket science working with these dogs when you're given the right information. Um, it doesn't take that long usually. So if you want to listen to all sorts of different things about dog training and dog food and dog advice and, you know, all sorts of weird and wonderful things about rescue organizations and DNA testing kits for dogs and stuff, then listen to my blogs. But if you want to sort your dog out, just go to the complete pack, take the trial. Sounds good. So the dog calming code, that's where everyone needs to, to go and check out what you're doing and, and get the $1 free trial, look at the course and solve all their, their big problems. So 
Dan, thanks so much for coming on the dog show today. I've learned a huge amount. Um, there's certainly some behavioral changes that I think I could make with, with my dog and I hope everyone else takes some, some jewels away from the interview as well. So thanks so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Will. Appreciate it.